Robin Carlson, who is a um, naturalist, observer, and fire ecologist. And I have, uh, if you are watching this uh, from sunny California, you are quite aware of the fire um, season that we've had in the West this year. She's been tracking this for, for quite a while as an active part of her nature journaling. And I thought that it would be really timely and also inspiring for folks to take a look at her journals and her process and to see how she, um, how she thinks about fire, because so much of what we do in journaling, it's a thinking process. How do we think about fire? And how do we, um, how do we start to document this, these processes in our journal? Um, and so I, I, I thought perhaps uh, a good way of starting would just be to, um, we're gonna uh, join in with, with, with Robin. And um, Robin, I was wondering if, if you might be able just to maybe start by just telling us a little bit about what got you into this and um, a little bit of that, that, that process so far. What has been your, what was sort of your kind of link into this? How does that, um, how does that kind of look in your journals? And we'll look at sort of where that is going now because things have, well, kind of blown up for you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here chatting with all of you about um, one of my favorite topics in the world. Um, so just a little bit of an introduction about how I got into this. Um, I am, biology is the great love of my life. And so I have always known that I was going to be focusing on biology in one way or another. And so um, what interests me, interests me most about life is change. How did we get where we are? How did anything that we're looking at that's alive got to where it, get to where it is? Um, and what does that mean about where it's going next? And so I um, started out um, planning to be an academic biologist. And so I got a master's in evolutionary biology because I thought the big questions about change were a fantastic place to start. And I had a wonderful time studying that. Um, and then after school, I went to work um, on um, much more um, shorter term uh, time frame change, um, working on stream habitat restoration projects, um, tracking them in California um, to benefit salmon and looking at how um, once you start stop disturbing an environment, um, how, how it can go back to uh, a much healthier and, and more natural state. Um, and in that case, specifically streams. So then after I'd done that for quite a while, I decided that I wanted to bring art and illustration much more into my professional life. And um, I wanted to still, though, focus on change. And what I really wanted to do at that point was to um, move from, in some ways, a much more academic look at the natural world and at biology. I wanted to um, really focus on a specific place, a place near home um, that I could get to know incredibly intimately and deeply. Um, and so I was thinking about how I could do that and what a, you know, a good way to look at change on a very small local scale would be. Um, and just as I was thinking about that, there was a fire in the hills to the west of where I live. And it um, certainly by the standards of the fires that are happening right now was not a particularly big fire, but it did burn um, the entirety of a very popular local hiking trail that is also um, part of a University of California natural reserve. And so I realized that um, this would be an amazing opportunity to both get to observe rapid change after a disturbance um, in a natural area that was going to be left completely alone to do its thing um, after the fire, aside from some trail maintenance, because of course this continues to be a um, fantastic place for anyone to visit. Um, and so it would be a great place to watch change. It would be a great place too for me to really, really deeply get to know what lives in that place um, and watch as that changed over time after the fire. Um, and then also because it's a place that 
um, so many people in the area know and love and visit a lot. Um, I figured it was also a really great way to um, sort of share what I was learning um, visually um, and um, through words, um, what I was learning about what was happening there in a way that people could re relate to really, um, really uh, emotionally connectedly, because I think that that, I mean, that was one of the reasons that I really wanted to um, switch to using art and illustration to um, explore the topics that I'm interested in biology, because I think that's one of the very best ways to make connections with other people and to help share um, the things that I am learning and am finding most interesting. So after the fire, I started visiting the reserve um, uh, monthly as much as I could um, to walk through the reserve and to see what I could see and to capture it in my notebook and um, just to see where that took me. Um, so when you, we talked a little bit uh, earlier, you were, you described to me sort of you're a few different process, processes that you have in your head as a, as a naturalist, as a nature journaler. And that sometimes you go out and from, from what you study, what you know, you've got a target. There's something that you really want to dig into. And when you're out there, you're collecting things in your journal. You sort of got, you've got a project in your head and you're collecting information that is specific to that project. And when you do that, you're able to go really deep and collect a lot of data on that specific thing. But there are other things that when you are, are approaching things in that way that, will, that you'll miss because you've got this focus. Again, our, our brains only have a limited bandwidth. So sometimes you're kind of zooming in. And, but you also described to me that sometimes you've got you, you intentionally go out without this specific agenda, kind of have a kind of blank slate and, um, and, and can, um, and, and will collect whatever really presents itself to you. I was wondering if you might be able to show us what that looks like. Absolutely. When, um, oh, great. So yeah, so I will go ahead and open up my slides and go through those first two um, concepts. Does that sound good? That sounds okay, terrific. Great. Then let me share my screen. And what I'm going to do, actually, first, give me a thumbs up that you're show, seeing my screen. Let me make sure. Okay, before yes. I go on. We see, we see you and we see your screen. Fantastic. And let me just... Oops. So what I'm going to show you just quickly before I talk about some specific visits to the reserve is just a little bit, now that I've got the screens open, just a little bit of orientation about that fire five years ago. Um, so this was in 2015 in the summer, um, just starting just about the same time as the fires um, all started this, this last summer as well. And so you can see... Um, this was a fire that burned a whole lot more than the reserve. The re reserve is marked in gold um, there, um, but it did completely burn the reserve. Um, and then just for orientation too, because I'm going to give you an update based on what has happened this last summer, you can see Lake Berryessa in the upper left-hand corner. So you can see that Cold Canyon is just east of Lake Berryessa. So um, when Cold Canyon burned in 2015, it had been 30 years since the reserve had burned before. It did burn pretty thoroughly 30 years before. And so what I was looking at um, after this 2015 fire was um, an ecosystem that had had a relatively uh, healthy amount of time to respond to that fire and to uh, work its way back to um, you know, some of the more um, climax communities um, in that ecosystem. So over this last summer, uh, excuse me, just a second. Let me figure out why I just lost. There we go. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Um, 
So this last summer in that same area, there was a much, much, much larger fire. You can see Lake Berryessa there in the middle. Um, so Cold Canyon is again, just to the east of that and definitely completely burned again, along with a whole lot of the surrounding area. I actually drew this before the Hennessy fire, which was part of the LNU lightning complex in August, um, was completely out. So this is actually, the perimeter is actually a little bit bigger, but this is pretty much the extent of it. And so this was five years in between. So um, it will be very interesting to see now what unfolds after so much shorter a time period has passed in between fires. And I just want to, before I get started, just want to show some of the drawings I did um, right at the beginning of September once I could get back up to Cold Canyon. I haven't been in yet. I'm waiting for a research permit to actually enter the reserve, which is closed, but I wanted to draw what I could see from the highway and just get a first look at what things looked like and how completely things had burned. Um, and so that was really interesting. But what I want to focus on now is Sorry about that. Um, what I want to focus on now is, is what Jack just described um, really well, which are the sort of the two different ways that I approach visits um, up to Cold Canyon. Um, and I'm going to start with the way that I started all my visits right off the bat, which was to head up there planning to observe as much as I could without any particular goals in mind other than what can I see, um, how does it look different from the last time, and what is around me. So I'm going to take you through a, just a couple of quick visits like that and show you what, what my sketchbook pages look like and um, what I was thinking about as I drew them. So. This first visit was in March, the first spring after the fire. So the everything was quite recently burned. Um, and so I was just taking it all in and looking for all of the, um, you know, looking for all of the parts of, of recovery after fire that I was expecting, as well as trying to keep my all of my senses open for anything that I wasn't expecting to see too. So I was capturing resprouting. You can see in the top picture, resprouting buckeye from its base. I was just looking for any, you know, any signs of life along the way, capturing some beetles, looking at different resprouting patterns in um, California Bay laurel, um, some really interesting sprouting directly from the burl um, that I could see above ground, and then other sprouts that were coming from roots below ground. And of course it was spring, so I was, you know, drawing wildflowers all over the place um, as they enjoy what is their absolute best time, um, quote unquote, in the sun um, after a fire because all of the shade has been removed and this is when they can bloom and grow and um, develop their seed banks, um, at, you know, in full glory and profusion. So of course it was a joy to be able to draw flowers everywhere. Um, and then more flowers, more insects, um, looking at interesting, um, incredibly um, lush carpets of moss that had come up in areas that um, I was surprised to see them because it seemed to be receiving a whole lot more sun than I was expecting. So um, finding surprises like that was fun. Um, and um, capturing the, you know, all of the insects that have followed the flowers right back to the area so that even though it was just burned and we might be thinking about a burned area as um, being devoid of life potentially for a while, um, actually recently burned areas can be absolutely full of life. Um, and that was very exciting to get to see. So uh, I- Just a quick question oh, here yeah, about your, um, your approach here. So yeah. you're trying to get a lot of information clearly and quickly. Um, is this uh, using a combination of, of pen and colored pencil to, 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 to get your effects in there? Yeah, so um, these slides have mostly been the ones where it wasn't smaller images. These are mostly two pages. Um, this is usually two page spreads in my journal. Um, yeah, and I either, I try to go out with as little equipment as possible. So I either go out with a, a pen and a handful of colored pencils, which is what you saw in this visit, or with a very small um, set of watercolors, which you'll see in other visits. And I am capturing, while I'm there, um, 
you know, everything in pen and ink and I'm adding some color there, but I also take a lot of reference photographs so that I can fill in details that I didn't spend time on in the field. So the, some of the colored pencil here was done while I was out in the field. Um, some of the more careful colored pencil, like in the B fly down at the bottom, I finished that at home from my reference photos. Great. And um, could you jump back to that slide of the, I think it was a, a might have been a, a, a bay tree sprouting. That, oh yeah, that, Sorry, uh, yes, the bay tree. Yeah. This, um, this sort of, this kind of application of just a little bit of color on the thing that you're, you're targeting, I just get this very quick sense of charred landscape and and, and what is, is sprouting. So just also from thinking from a kind of graphic design and science communication perspective, this one just struck me as such an effective and powerful way to emphasize and to show what you are um, observing here. Yeah, thank you. I do think about that a lot. Um, and it does, you're right, it works particularly well here for the for the still blackened <laughs> um, branches and uh, soil. Um, but I, I often, I mean, I try to be conscious about how I use color um, often just to bring focus to a particular part of the drawing. And also practically, because if I focus in on the things that are the most important that I wanna capture information about and don't worry about coloring the rest of it, it saves time too when I'm out in the field. And I think that's an important consideration too, because I'm never up there with as much time as I wish I had. And so I'm always making choices about what I wanna capture um, and how to, how to make sure that I capture for myself so I can remember the most important things. And that's something that I'll talk about a little bit in the demo too, is, is trying to make choices all the time about capturing the most important parts of the image. A lot of us might, might kind of approach like, oh, I need to finish a picture, meaning take the same amount of kind of effort and work and from side to side, put that in all across it. Had you done that here, this would be less valuable communication tool um, and but also you'd also spend a lot of time out there in the field doing something that wasn't your sort of primary focus of investigation where you could have been like, oh, check out what the moss is doing too. Um, so I, I just thought that this is, there's some useful strategies that we're seeing in these pages as they go by. As we go forward um, and we get to that Sarah orange tip butterfly, just look at this minimalist butterfly. Love oh, there, right there in the middle of the page. Yeah, so, that's another thing I try to do is to, as something flutters by, watch it as closely as possible so that I'm figuring out what I think the most important part of it is. And then I can draw that once it's gone because I remember those very, very basic shapes. This is just really empowering to me because you know, sometimes I get wrapped around like, like, I didn't see like, what was the head doing? This butterfly has no head, no antennae, and it's okay. So. Robin is giving you all permission to do more with less. Very much so. And I find that much more useful. I mean, that was the other thing I was going to add to both the thing about the color and truly the butterfly too. I find that much more useful and that make give, I have a much stronger response to seeing that when I'm looking back through my notebook than I do that very detailed bee fly. The bee fly was fun to draw. It was a really good exercise for me in drawing it, but I actually get a whole lot more out of that simple orange tip for sure. Um, and it's the same for the landscapes where I have really focused on a particular detail and left the rest um, sketchy. Those just convey more to me and I, I mean, I just respond to them more strongly than a more finished landscape and you'll see some more finished landscapes in here and I don't find them as effective. So, I, oh, hey, that was the perfect segue. <laughs> uh, so the last thing I wanted to mention about this, this visit in, in March was that I do try to step back and look at the bigger picture too and try to um, figure out how to convey things like the um, completely sort of ghostly tree skeletons that form this river of gray down the hillsides. Um, in, in this case, also fields of California poppies that were absolutely amazing and enjoying their lack of shade on the hillside. Um, and then finally, I, I've tried to pay a lot of attention to the stream that runs through the canyon. Um, it was interesting because it was after the fire completely black, filled with the mud and the ash that had washed down the hills um, into the stream. And so this was still 
in the process of it returning from um, it not being clear that there was water in it at all. I could see water now, but things were still quite dark and it was um, a very, very thin layer of water. So it was quite still greenish, brownish. Um, and I wanted to, wanted to capture that to remember it. So I'm going to move on to one more um, uh, visit that I went on without a plan. Um, but this one was really interesting because I showed up without a plan, but the visit itself actually ended up turning into this amazing story <laughs> that I was sort of, oh, I apologize. One more thing. I did want to mention that because this is a highly uh, used um, trail by lots and lots of people all the time, I also try very hard to capture um, human um, artifacts left in the space. And so um, the canyon was closed at this time that I, I made this visit. It was closed for, uh, I think, a good nine months after the fire. And so I found it very interesting to track the traces of how many people were still visiting the canyon even while it was closed. So this was fresh graffiti that I hadn't seen the time I was there before. The trail down below was a new trail placed by clearly a bunch of different groups of people you know, down from the main trail to the creek, which is not great for erosion, but also just, I think it's important to document how people are using this space too. So I do want to move on um, and go through this other visit that turned into a story because I went there completely open to finding anything. Um, this is now a visit from actually just this last February. Um, so four and a half years after the fire. And I had been um, hearing um, from some of the reserve staff that it can be absolutely amazing um, while the toyons are fruiting um, that there will be a time each year and it can vary which month it happens in but the, the um, robins will flock <laughs> to the canyon and spend oh maybe two or three days just stripping the toyons of their berries just huge numbers of robins um, just gorging themselves on the toyons. And so I discovered when I got there that I had happened to arrive during <laughs> during the robin's visit and they were there was a, they seemed to stay in one flock which was really interesting. It wasn't more than one group but it was an enormous flock of them and they were very loud and as I walked down the trail I sort of I think kept them moving just a ways ahead of me but they would settle on a on a um on a bunch of toyon and eat. And then once I caught up to them, they would slowly make their way off. So I was able to sort of catch up with them and observe them, catch up with them and observe them. Um, and I was so excited to have actually been there for this event since it is only ever a couple of days. Um, so I was there to capture anything I could see. Um, I was happy to capture the robins. Um, I really enjoyed um, finding a buckeye that had a bunch of different sort of stages of leaf buds sprouting and it was really fun to capture all in one go um, this you know all of these different steps in the sprouting um, but then as I kept going um, through the canyon I continued to be you know just a few steps behind the flock of robins and um, in addition to seeing them directly I found I'm always paying attention for signs of things that I'm not going to see in person like the fox the coyote the bobcats that are there um, and I, I never ever see um, bird droppings on the trail but I figured this must have been from the robins because there were so many of them and they were so active so I thought it was exciting to find an additional sign of them while still capturing lichens and galls and mushrooms and um, some ceanothus that I've been watching carefully. Um, and then finally it the sort of the end of my trip had <laughs> the story took a took a dark turn um, as I was walking back the trail to back down the trail um, heading out of the canyon. First, I found a big pile of feathers and thought, oh, there was some big drama that happened here. I didn't see any bodies. It was just feathers. So um, a little mystery as to what had happened there. And then much further down the trail, um, completely unrelated to the feathers, I actually saw a dead robin lying a little ways um, down the hill from me. And I um, did not examine it closely. I left it where it was, but from all the angles I was able to look at it, I didn't see any signs of anything having caught it. So this was also a mystery. I don't know what happened to it, but I thought it was just this very interesting way for my trip to come full circle, watching all of these lively robins full of life gorging themselves, and then the end of the cycle too, with one of them dying for unknown reasons. 
So those were the two um, visits that I wanted to show you where I showed up without a plan. And then I also have a um, couple of examples of visits where I did go with some specific goals to address. Um, and the first one was that right after the canyon burned, um, one of the things that the natural reserve staff had been concerned about was how the blue oaks that um, are in the canyon would do after the fire. Um, Seven's Cold Canyon is a mixture of riparian and chaparral and um, blue oak woodland and savanna. And because blue oaks have been declining in California and because um, they, I mean, they tend to do relatively well after fire, but are not necessarily as hardy as some of the other California oaks, there was some concern that the fire might have burned hot enough um, and long enough in the canyon that the oaks might have trouble recovering. And so that was something I knew from the beginning that I wanted to pay a lot of attention to um, in my visits was to see um, how the oaks might be doing over time. And that, of course, is something that isn't immediately obvious um, because even trees that didn't have all of their foliage burned or, um, or in some cases have even started to re-sprout don't necessarily in the long term make it after a fire. So it's something that it takes many years to know. But I was very interested to, as soon as I could, um, sort of explore different patterns of regrowth in oaks. And so in advance, I'd been reading that um, patterns of regrowth are different or, you know, can be different. There's overlap between them for sure. Um, but that blue oak tends to resprout from its crown after fire, assuming that its crown wasn't so completely burned that all of the um, buds have been completely, were completely killed. But, um, but where, whenever they can, they do tend to resprout from their crown. And that interior live oaks, which are the other oak that are found in the reserve, um, tend to sprout from their bases. And so I wanted to spend a visit really focusing on oaks and seeing what I could see in the canyon. And so I went looking for those patterns um, and documented them and spent a little time, you know, just trying to be uh, a little more familiar <laughs> with both of those kinds of oaks. Um, this, and then also, yes, please. Uh, this is, uh, if we could jump back to those oaks for a second. This is a kind of a very interesting um, set that you've got here, something that I think is um, another sort of example of uh, a, a nature journaling strategy that you can extract and then you can apply wherever you want to, is what Robin has done here is it's a deliberate comparison. So um, if you just go out and you look at the blue oak, there will be things that you won't notice because you're just looking at the blue oak. But once you are looking at the blue oak, comparing it to something that's sort of simple, similar here in the interior live, you can go like, oh, I'm noticing at least in this example that the bluer oaks have fewer primary trunks and they're a little bit bigger. And on my interior live, I've got more branching smaller trunks. Maybe that's just an example uh, that is specific to these two trees, or there may be a pattern here, but you're not going to, if, if you had just done the blue oak, then your brain goes like, oh, there's, there's just sort of, there's a tree thickness, end of story. But the minute you're doing a comparison, you start to notice the things that are different between them. And that gets your brain to engage with this in a different way. Um, similarly, you notice she's just, there's, there's also a kind of a parallel construction on these two pages. You've got the tree and the leaf, the tree and the leaf. And when you're doing a comparison like that, kind of keeping some sort of structure in your head helps you be a little bit more deliberate. But this activity that she's got here of this joint comparison is a very powerful way of getting your brain to notice more. Again, if Robin had just gone out and drawn one of these trees, her brain would not be able to dance with what am I really noticing that's specific about each one as well? You'd think that if you're just focusing on one tree, you see more about it. But the minute you've got two side by side, subtleties will appear to you. For instance, green. One is a darker green, the other is a more lemony green, right? 
if you had just done one, your brain would go, oh, it's green. And that would be the end of the story. Sorry to interrupt. This is awesome. No problem. Thank you for the interruption. That's great. Um, yeah, and so uh, just a note with the canyon having burned again so recently, I suspect that probably doesn't mean very good things for the blue oaks, but it will be very interesting to, to see what happens. So what I also happened, I had gone there expecting to pay attention to oaks and it just happened that it was an excellent time of year. This was in September um, to see something else related to oaks. I, in fact, just about stepped on this in the trail. There was a fallen oak leaf sitting in the middle of the trail covered in galls, two different kinds of gall covered in both of them. Um, and so I, you know, <laughs> I thought, well, this is just amazing. I came here to look at oaks and look at this. I've got galls too. So I uh, started this drawing there. I finished this one at home. The, clearly that drawing of the gall wasp, which is very, very tiny, um, was done from a photograph and not one that I took. Um, but I wanted to have for myself a record of, of what, the, what the creature that um, caused those was. But this was, this was probably one of my favorite <laughs> accidental finds at the at the reserve because the galls are so amazingly beautiful and of course the life cycle of the wasp that makes them is amazing and I just also loved how perfect it was that I found them on the day that I was there for oak trees. Oh, that's fun and I'll just jump back there for Sorry about that. I want to just point out kind of a graphic artistic thing that you see on this page and the previous one check out what's Robin's got going on here with the shadows. Those shadows on of the galls themselves pop those galls up off that surface. That same drawing without those shadows, you wouldn't get the sense that those are sticking up. Um, same thing, let's just jump back to the previous picture. Look at the shadows going of the branches above going across the, the trunk of the blue oak there. I saw the same thing kind of going on. You had these cool shadows going across the creek, the river in a previous slide. Um, so um, she's using a, um, a blue or a purple pencil just to pop these in, but it's a deliberate part of her observation process. She's noticing what are, what's going on with shadows and light. And this is important for a fire ecologist, right? Um, where, uh, you know, fires come in, you let all this light into the system that otherwise wouldn't be getting there. But also for us as artists and graphic people, steal these shadow ideas. This is, there's some, there's some useful stuff right here. So yeah, so my final um, drawing from drawings from this trip was just to show that even when I go with a specific goal in mind, I'm also still trying to capture as many other interesting things that popped out to me. Um, for example, this was September, so almost nothing was blooming. Um, so I captured the few notable things that were um, still trying to, you know, keep a record of what the landscape looked like, um, you know, stepping back and looking at it from that. And then also continuing to capture some re-sprouting um, shrubs. In this case, it's chemise. And then I have one last example of um, a targeted trip. Um, and this one was from um, January 2019. Um, I was, um, this was sort of the, well, after the Oaks, the Oaks I did go with a specific goal, but with this trip, what I really wanted to do was pay attention to something that I had not been paying attention to at all before. Um, and I, figured that going um, in the winter when things were bare and there were, you know, there were a whole lot less um, uh, foliage covering things would be an excellent time to start looking at, at lichens and funguses to a certain extent, but especially lichens. Um, and one of the things I started out with was there's a very interesting boulder um, right along the beginning of the trail that had split in the fire um, because the moisture in the boulder um, heated up enough that it boiled and expanded and split boulder um, nearly in half. And so that was an interesting thing to learn about in the beginning. Um, but then what I realized is there, um, what was really interesting too, was to look, it was a fairly lichen covered boulder to begin with, um, and that I would be able to see as the lichen colonized those fresh rock faces. And so that was the first thing I looked at was to try to get an idea of all of the lichens I could find on the outside of the boulder um, and compare that to what had started to appear inside. And I could only find two different kinds that were um, starting that colonization process. 
Um, but that has been an interesting thing to watch since then. And then I continued on that trip to look for lichens elsewhere in the reserve, but also again to capture other things such as um, the chaparral current, one of the first things that starts to bloom in the year. Um, buckeyes are just always interesting because the way that everything about them is, is makes such amazing, interesting shapes that I always am tempted to draw buckeyes. Um, I continued to look for lichens on the trip. This is also another example of um, sort of tracking human artifacts too. There was this amazingly sparkly glittery stone that someone had carefully placed on a rock along the trail, which was fascinating. Um, I also found it fascinating on a um, burned uh, pitcher sage that was re-sprouting. Um, I also saw three different types of fungus enjoying the dead wood. Um, after the fire, and that's an important, a really important thing to um, recognize that all of that dead wood is useful <laughs> to things and delicious um, to life and is not going to waste and is being happily consumed by these fungi. Um, and then finally, um, a little bit more lichen. Um, I was capturing the different kinds of fern I could find along the trail, um, looking at dried out, um, foothill mules ears because they're always absolutely amazing glowing in the sun and then another human trace someone had built a little rock cairn in the creek um, and then not on this visit but sort of as a result of this visit where I had focused so much on lichens I've been um, oops I apologize there we go um, I have been you know, trying to capture lichens as I go in visit since then as well. And one of the things that I wanted to do after that first trip was to sort of make a lichen map on a rock and look more schematically at how all of the different types of lichens were relating to each other um, on the rock and sort of spreading out across the rock face. So that was a, a nice investigation, a further investigation that I never would have come up with if I hadn't focused on lichens in the first place. Oh. We're, we're seeing a bunch of really interesting thinking tools. Um, and this page is a great example of it. So you've got zooming in on, as you notice that she's, she's changing, intentionally changing her level of focus as she's out there. Sometimes she's backing up, taking in the big picture. Sometimes she's zooming in and going, oh my gosh, on this picture, Sage, three different types of, of, of fungus. And here's, here's the structure of each of those. Here with this, um, with the, the lichens here, Take a look at having the detailed things and the map. Having those two side by side allows you to, to, do, to think in a different way. Each one of these journaling tools will help your brain make a little bit of a different investigation in the place that you're in. And that changes the way that you think. So there's lots of strategies. As you see these pages, sometimes when you're looking at these pages, you go like, oh my gosh, I love the way that you drew that, right? Don't get locked in that. I'd say one of the most useful things that you can, when you're kind of looking at these sort of pages, like what are ideas that Robin is using to document what she notices and her ideas? The more that you get a bunch of these different strategies in your pocket, the more that you can, you'll be able to do. And I, I, just to add to that, so much of this comes from visiting the same place over and over and over again and thinking about the things that I see every time that I'm there. Um, there's a familiarity that comes from that that leads, certainly for me, leads to a whole lot more questions and also just ways of representing things too that never would have occurred to me if I had only been there a few times or just once. So that is... That is my huge plug for the idea of um, spending time spread out over time, revisiting the same place over and over again, because it will lead you to questions that you never would have had otherwise. Um, and so, Jack, that is the end of my um, example visits to Stebbins. So I think <laughs> we're ready to move on to live fire. Excellent. <laughs> Let's get burning. And we did, we did some burning together. Um, so when I uh, uh, really for, first got to spend a chunk of time with, with Robin, 
um, we went to this wonderful prescribed burn event in northeastern California together. Um, we, um, do, do you want to ex explain that? I've also brought my, my journal of my notes and I can share those with the, the folks here too. Um, might be uh, fun to explore this and I'd love to, um, you're also gonna do a little, I hope we have time to do a little bit of demonstration of the, uh, of some of your, your strategies as we go. Uh, yeah, so I can give a just a quick um, introduction um, to the event. So Miriam Morrill, who is someone that I'm sure many of you are familiar with from the Nature Journal Club, um, is a fire scientist and um, helped to or did put together um, a nature journaling um, contingent um, to join in on um, a training exchange, which is a nature conservancy run program to um, train uh, wildland firefighters in prescribed burn techniques. And so we went um, to the Klamath uh, last October to spend a few days um, out in the field watching the firefighters actually conducting some of their controlled burns um, and learning about what they're doing, but then also a really important component of it was the fact that this was not just a government prescribed burn, but this was also um, what the Nature Conservancy has been instrumental in doing is bringing the local people um, on the land um, in the areas that they do these training exchanges um, into the programs and um, it, you know, in many ways um, helping to run the programs. Um, and so um, because this, uh, it, it, is um, Karuk land and because they have a um, very active tribal burning program, um, they were, you know, they're instrumental um, participants and leaders of these burns. And so we also spent a lot of time learning about the cultural importance of the burns and what the burning does for all of the um, natural resources used for cultural reasons by the Karuk there. Um, and so that that was a really important piece of it. Um, so I can quickly show um, I, I'm and I will keep this very quick. Um, some of the drawings that I did um, during this event um, to show um, a, a very different kind of journaling because um, what I am focusing on here is on capturing capturing lots of things that are changing and moving very quickly rather than plants and um, lichens that are not. Um, and so what's most important here is um, I think the decision making that happens before I start drawing in figuring out what the most important thing that I want to convey in that scene is, um, whether it's firefighters preparing, um, lighting torches and starting the fires, um, watching the flame behavior and the smoke behavior. Um, this is another example of, of, again, trying to capture what the smoke was doing during the burn, um, what the light looked like with the uh, fire behind the trees. Um, again, trying to capture what people are doing, but also, again, what the smoke and the flames are doing as, um, as they're all rapidly changing. And um, then finally experimenting, again, with, uh, with ways of, of really focusing in on what I found most important about the scene. So I'm not trying to capture the whole forest. I'm not trying to capture the burned ground. Um, I'm, for example, just capturing this amazing pattern of flames um, that had been set um, in that fire. Um, so um, Jack, if you want to, yeah, that was the end of my Klamath slides. slide. Jack, if you want to talk about your experience a little bit, and then I have, if there's time, a um, short demo um, using um, some people and um, live fire from a more local controlled burn that I also attended recently. But I'll turn it back to you right now, Jack. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, now, let's see. Hi. Um, let's jump over to the document camera, and I'll just, uh, it, was, it was neat because we had uh, a whole bunch of uh, nature journalers there at this burn, um, and so we got to observe this through so many different um, perspectives. Um, Lori Wiggum, Marley was there, Fiona was there, me, Robin, it was, we, we had like, we had a, a critical mass. Um, let's check out 
document camera. Sorry, it's upside down. Um, we all got geared up in firefighter uh, protective uh, clothing, and they taught us how to use and deploy the, the, the fire shelter so that if there was a burnover, um, we would still be safe. Um, and at the start, they were sort of helping us sort of see the difference between places that had been unburned and were super dense and places that were a little bit more open that had been burned in the past. And then once we started to light the fires, uh, so I'm using uh, a little diagram here to show a line of firefighters um, um, out on one side of the burn, others on the other side sort of lighting the fire, and these ones over here prevent this fire from going where they don't want it. This was, as Robin was mentioning, the smoke does cool things and exploring that. Um, the, uh, we met with uh, tribal elders who talked to, us about, talked to us about the importance of how the plants, how they were doing the burning to improve plants that they used for um, uh, traditional practices and survival. Um, we, let's see here, we also spent time, oh, there we go, um, this is more active, active burning. Um, I found using gouache for smoke sort of saved me, um, putting in some opaque gouache for those, those, those walls of, of smoke that came up. It's so interesting to draw fire because when it's the brightest thing that you're looking at, um, but once you start putting that sort of the intense colors on it, those cause a lot of darkness on your page. Um, so how do you work with the contrasts in order to be able to, to, to do what we see? Um, there's so many different things to, to, to look at, so many different views. And the more that you can get those dancing together on your page, the more that you're going to be able to, to notice more, see more. So this is, I think, a good example of just sort of having uh, an array of tricks in your sort of your, your little bag of tricks things that you can do to help um, document what you see. So I'm going to jump back to, to you, Robin, because this um, uh, idea of having a little bit of a demonstration um, of your process is very, very appealing. Great. OK, I'm going to share my slides again so that I can quickly give a little bit of background on this um, more local controlled burn and then I'm going to do a demo from that and it will be a quick demo because it's about drawing action quickly. Uh, so I um, last January um, had the um, great fortune to attend a um, local burn at the Cache Creek Conservancy. Um, they maintain a tending and gathering garden along with the um, local uh, Yocha Dehe Wintun Nation um, to grow uh, plants that are of various cultural importances to the tribe. And one of the ways that they manage that garden is through um, periodic burning. And so they have a um, annual community event to which anyone is invited to attend where they do some burning in that garden. And it is a very, very different experience than the prescribed burn up on the Klamath. Um, no one is in protective gear. There is, as you see, a fire truck on site, but um, in, if there are kids running around, um, people poking at fire. It is, it's just a very, very different environment, but I think one that replicates um, the um, more traditional indigenous burning practices considerably more closely than a big government um, sponsored burn. So I made notes about um, the different plants that were going to benefit from the burn and a little map of the conservancy. Um, and then they got started and I was working fast to capture the action, um, capturing again both people and fire and really trying to focus on um, rather than drawing everything, only drawing the parts that were most important to me to convey. Um, trying to look at these little patches of um, fire burning in deer grass, what the flames looked like, what the smoke was doing. 
this one, I really wanted to remember how much of a community event this felt like. So there were kids out there with sticks, poking at the fires and the deer grass, um, grown-ups poking with sticks in the deer grass. Um, and it, it just felt just very, you know, very um, community driven and um, very low key. Then I wanted to focus a little bit more on flames, um, trying to really capture the movement of the flames um, and the smoke, and then also watching big pieces of ash flying away from the burning cattails, um, looking at patterns of char on the, on the cattails. It was very interesting to me that um, looking at the way the air made the flames move around the um, cattail stock um, meant that there were these interesting spiraling patterns of char Mm. Um, this is burning redwood, uh, red, excuse me, red bud stumps, um, again, capturing people just out there poking at fires, um, a little bit of trying to capture the aftermath. So, uh, a red bud that had been burned a year before, um, there was some very, very happy fungus growing on it, enjoying the burned wood, um, and then the ashes of a, um, red bud that had been burned that day. And then one last quick thing before the demo, just um, there was this amazing demonstration of how wildlife survives at least this kind of a low key calm controlled burn. Um, a firefighter discovered uh, at the base of one of these clumps of burned deer grass. You can see it looks like it was all burned, but down in the core, it's still quite wet, moist, stayed cool, and there was a juvenile alligator lizard that was perfectly fine <laughs> um, that we got to see, you know, just walk away from the fire. So that was an excellent illustration. What I'm going to do now is because I can't show this at the same time as um, my demo, I'm going to um, talk to you a little bit about these pictures that I'm going to draw from and then I will switch over to my um, phone camera so that you can actually see the drawing. And what I'm wanting to demonstrate now is picking um, what I think are the important elements of this scene that I want to convey and doing it fairly rapidly because these are people who are moving around and these are flames and smoke that are changing all the time too. So um, one of the things that I wanted to convey that was really important was the group nature and how close people were standing to the fire and all very calm and relaxed and just watching. Um, and then I wanted to convey a little bit more too about the um, people who are actually setting the burn and in charge of the burn and showing what they're doing and getting a little bit closer to looking at, at what the patterns of the flames looked like um, and also the smoke. So I will show this again once I'm done with the demo, but for right now I am going to switch over to my camera. Okay, let's see, bring that up, okay. So what I am, what I'm gonna do for this demo is use probably a darker black pen than I usually use in the field so that you can see what I'm doing. Um, but I'm just going to get started here and I'm going to put both of those images on this piece of paper because um, I want to do this all in one demo. I might not try to squeeze so much on here um, ordinarily, but I'm going to start with that top image of the people standing in front of the fire and I'm just going to start marking in some of the people in the front and I'm doing it really quickly and I am not worrying at all about these looking particularly accurate. I would like it to at least a little bit look like they're people, um, but I'm not going for any sort of detail, just capturing the general idea of a bunch of people standing around in front of this fire. Um, and I am focusing mostly on heads and shoulders because that's what sticks out to me most about that image. Uh, it was a cold day, people have hoods on their jackets, They've got hats on their heads. And then there's also a little tiny detail that I do want to add in quickly. There was a pier over um, sort of to the side of this image that went out. Of, we are actually looking in that image out towards um, a little pond. And so because they were burning Thule and cattails cat um, very near this wooden structure, um, 
one person was assigned to keep the tule and cattails and the structure itself wet during the burn, um, just in case anything got a little bit out of hand and the flames started creeping closer. So I wanna just capture that there were people there in the background keeping the tule wet in the face of the flames. And then some unburned tule over in the area of the, um, over in the area of the pier. So I'm gonna leave that for the purposes of this demonstration. Outdoors, the nice thing is pen dries really fast, but I'm gonna give that pen a couple of minutes to dry before I start adding the paint for the flames. And I'm gonna go down to my second image, trying to capture a person more close up to give a better idea of what they're doing. I'm gonna take that firefighter and get started. I'm just gonna start at the top because I am not concerned again about accuracy or making a recognizable person. Just a few details about his head and face and we'll get his body. And I wanna capture the fact that he's got the drip torch and is actively setting those clumps of deer grass on fire. Capture the important curve in the drip torch. And I will give him the rest of his body really quickly just to set the scene. Um, and then what I wanna do is also give the idea, so I wanna capture these burned clumps of deer grass that have already burned and that still have flames on them that I'm gonna capture as well. And I'm so I'm getting, giving the idea of this blacker, more burned vegetation. And then there's unburned clumps of deer grass behind them and I wanna get those in there too. And then there's another clump of burned grass up a little bit higher for some more flames. And we'll give him a little ground over here. And then I'm gonna let that pen dry and I'm gonna go back to the fire on top. And so when I am trying to capture fire, I am, it is constantly moving. So there is no perfect image that I have to capture perfectly. What I am looking at is the overall character of what the flames are doing um, and noticing that where the fire is hottest, it is yellow. And so I start with that at the bottom and I'm trying to work very wetly with the watercolor because I need it to stay wet as I add additional color. So I do that really roughly and then I go immediately to red. A lot of that fire looks orange, but because I'm working very wet red into this yellow, I will end up with my orange that way and it keeps it very simple if I'm only relying on two colors. So first I want to make sure that I get my red in there so that it can work into the yellow and make the orange. Um, what I really, really like about capturing fire in watercolor is that the fire is doing its own thing and moving and the wetter I work in the watercolor, the more I let the water also do its own thing, which I think helps convey a much more sort of natural and compelling and lifelike character to the flames. So what I'm noticing about the flames that you can't see right now because you don't have the picture in front of you is that these flames have been, they're rising and they're doing a bunch of curling. And so I want to very much remember that curling pattern as they rise up. And so then, and then I just leave it. Even if there's stuff I don't particularly like about it, I work quickly and wet with the fire and then I leave it alone and let the water continue to do what it's doing. Um, and I am always much, much happier with the results when I do that. The last thing I wanna add to this image is some smoke. So I'm gonna mix a little bit of brown and blue to get this brownish smoke coming up from the flames, I'm gonna look for the shaded bottoms. I don't mind at all if some of my red paint finds its way into the smoke because that helps sort of capture the glow of those flames and I'm capturing the direction that the smoke is moving up and away from these flames. And then I'm gonna leave that one alone and I'm gonna move down to the second drawing to add in its color, I think I'm actually gonna start. I do really like capturing the color. A <laughs> um, little bit of the color, especially with these 
protective gear for the firefighters because I think it really helps <laughs> helps sort of capture that action there too. I'm gonna give everything on him a little color. I'm gonna capture his green pants a little bit and but just incredibly quick not worrying about uh, the, the, coloring in the, the line has frozen the camera oh thank you thank you thank you for telling me let me fix it Aww. now we know you okay fine. thank you <laughs> no problem okay and i definitely want to capture that red drip torch uh, and then i'm gonna work on these flames which are actually behaving quite differently than the flames at the top and that's why this is such a, a fun comparison between these two these flames and these sort of small fires and these little clumps of deer grass that are also i think starting to burn out um, a little bit at this point um, these flames are just sort of wafting straight up uh, completely unlike the curls that i was seeing in the other flames and so i really want to capture that just straight up motion i also want to capture just that little bit of flame on the drip torch too because that's important and it actually he's i believe walking probably when i took this so that flame is actually bending a little bit that way because he's in motion but the others are just going straight up um, and I see one there. And then I'm gonna go again right to the red and make sure that I just put that right into my yellow so it mixes and gives me a nice orange. Again, emphasizing that these are moving straight up here and a little bit at the top of that drip torch flame too. And then last but definitely not least, the smoke again here is behaving also differently in some ways the smoke has taken on the curly aspect and I can see the smoke, a lot of it I see also coming up from the already burned deer grass. So I wanna capture those interesting plumes of smoke still coming up. And then also there's some smoke coming from the still burning flames too. And I can see in this that the smoke is sort of accumulating back here behind the firefighter. And I'm gonna get this when it's little smoke trail too. And again, I wanna capture that this smoke to me looked like it was doing some more interesting things with curling. So I think that's important to remember. Make sure that's still on the screen. Okay, great. All right. Let me switch back now to the um, photograph so you can look at that again too um, for comparison. Let me just do this quick. So I, again, just want to quickly, you know, emphasize on the top, what was really important to me was capturing that movement of the flames up at the top where they look like they're sort of curling around and bending over. Um, and then down at the bottom, you can see those flames are reaching up much more straight and tall. Um, but then there are very interesting curly things happening with the smoke in that one. Oh, that's fun. That's really cool. It's, it's neat to see your there, there's sort of a connection between the, you know, the, 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 the playful, dynamic, uncontrolled nature of the fire, um, or the controlled nature of the fire, um, and, uh, and the way your watercolors are dancing with that. That's really useful. Yeah, and I, I want to emphasize again, too, I think that letting relaxing and letting the water in the watercolor do what it wants to, um, giving it plenty of pigment to play with and then letting it do what it wants really helps that because it, you can tell that the water got to do things naturally and that just gives the whole thing a much more dynamic feel. So I have, if there's a couple of minutes, I have just a few slides showing um, drawings I made going back in July after this fire to look at what the plants are doing, um, but that's well, only- I would love to see that. Could okay. you go back, actually, before you yes. do, could you go back to the painting? Just, it would be nice to oh, see yes. what, the, what the fire did as it's uh, dried a little bit with the mixing. Yes, you bet. I will switch back again quickly. Um, so I, I used a lot of water, so there's a lot that's still wet. 
Um, I imagine you can sort of see the shine on the page, but you can see that I've got a huge bloom <laughs> of red into one of my pieces of smoke. Um, that obviously is not realistic, but again, I think what you lose in um, accurate realism, you gain in liveliness and conveying the character of what was going on. Yep. Okay, I will go through these last few slides. Um, these are again a big um, contrast um, between the fast moving work um, at the fire and um, when I have considerably more time to spend on the observations. I went back in um, this last July um, to spend some time with the um, uh, the manager out at Cache Creek Conservancy to talk with him about what what plants they had been um, aiming to um, uh, assist with the fire and what we could see about those um, and some of the cultural importance of those. So I've drawn here with the dog bane that was growing fantastically in, in um, July. Um, some notes about why dogbane is important um, culturally um, because you can get incredibly strong cordage from its fibers um, and you can make nets that he said um, that the tribes were able to make nets that were strong enough to stop running deer. Um, so that is mm -hmm. kind of amazing when you're just looking at that fresh fiber inside a stock. Um, and we looked at um, Gumweed, which is, uh, the reserve manager called it a restoration superstar because it is so amazing for pollinators. Um, and I absolutely saw it covered in pollinators. I'm going to go forward a slide because that slide actually has some of the pollinators. Um, these were ones I saw in milkweed, but a lot of the, a lot of them were visiting um, gumweed as well. Um, so we spent some time talking about um, the native grasses that were coming back um, happily after the fire. Um, some things that you absolutely would not see in this area unless you had burned. They don't, they, they can't compete um, with all of the non-natives um, that are happy when there is no fire, but fire opens everything up again and they're able to come back um, really happily and healthily. Um, milkweed wasn't growing at the uh, at the conservancy until they started doing the burning and they didn't I mean, they didn't plant it It just showed up after the burning which mm -hmm. was really exciting and you can see how many insects were uh, enjoying it that day um, Dragonflies everywhere um, This this is my final slide. Um, I wanted to revisit that fungus. I saw growing on the stump of the burned red bud, red bud um, and it was uh, quite dried out at this time of year, but still obviously quite happily growing there. Um, and again, just an example of how important um, the things that look to us like just sort of a tragedy, all these burned stumps, but it's actually food and shelter and um, all sorts of important things to other living creatures. Um, and then we also talked a little bit about how important the tule that they burned is. Um, if left alone, tule forms a very, very thick thatch at its base um, that's completely impenetrable. And um, a lot of the organisms that would like to use tule as shelter can't get in and use it. Um, and uh, one of the examples are tricolored blackbirds that um, for whom tule is incredibly important habitat, but they can't use it unless it is kept healthy by burning. Um, so yeah, so this this has just been because this is close to my home. This has been an amazing, amazing opportunity to go from watching the burn to just a few months later seeing all of this amazing important change that has come from the burn. And that is the end of my slides. Uh, <laughs> it's really inspiring um, to to see. Uh, actually, <laughs> Mary just made the same comment that. Um, we, you know, you, if you hear fire reported on the on the television, it's how many acres were destroyed. That's right. Um, and so, but fire is a natural process that's been with us for a very, very long time. Its behavior under both climate change and um, because of uh, forest management practices has 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 changed now, and it's a it's a, a different beast. And we're seeing more major fires. Um, but to also understand that it has a place um, and is is an important, you know, 
an important part of the, the natural systems that have always been around us. This was absolutely fascinating to see your, your process, how you go about investigating things, the sorts of things that you choose to put on pages, the parts of those that you choose to develop. Um, there's a lot of really useful storytelling um, lessons here. And I hope that this has been inspiring for folks to, to motivate you to, to, to find what, even if there aren't fires um, close to you, um, you can use a lot of these same strategies to explore what other natural processes and kind of evidence of change are in the place where you live. So if you are in a place where there's not fires burning, um, but right now, nature around you is going through a big change. You're coming into fall, getting ready for winter. Um, you can, in exactly the same strategies that you see Robin using here, you can use those to document the change that you see around you. And when you have that idea in your head of looking for what are the, what are sort of the factors of stability and what are the factors of change in a place? As you walk through that landscape, you will notice things in a different way. You will see things that you otherwise would not have seen. And try that lens. Try just the, the lens, kind of click in the lens of stability, change in the place where you live. And we can see what we can do with that. Robin, thank you so much for sharing this with us. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to. This has been enormously fun. You know, Robin, if you guys want to learn more about change, this is, she's going to be teaching at Wild Wonder, and uh, you can learn more about her, her techniques and her mindset um, and her practices. Do you want to say a little bit about the class you're going to be doing at Wild Wonder? Yeah, so what, the way I structured that class is to um, take you on a virtual field trip that moves through space and time. So instead of focusing on a couple of visits like I did today, what I'm gonna do is move sort of more holistically, um, but with photographs so you can actually see some of the, um, you know, the actual photo documentation I've done of the reserve um, and that interspersed with examples from my sketchbooks and more demos. Um, so not just active fire, but also some of the um, more reflective drawing that I do when I'm up in the canyon. But I will be focusing a whole lot more on the details of fire ecology and what I've been learning um, over these last five years.